Hello, everybody, and welcome to Theology 101. Today, I'm going to talk about why making peace matters to God. Jesus said that his followers should make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The word peacemakers literally is the one who makes peace. This word was used of kings who established a peace treaty with another nation. This implies loving one's enemies. Why do I say that? We don't need to make peace with our friends. We need to make peace with people we don't have peace with. Now, Jesus did not say to be peacekeepers, but peacemakers. The goal is not to keep peace with people we get along with, but to make peace with those we don't get along with. This is a very difficult beatitude to apply, right? In fact, look at what Jesus says later in this sermon. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Peacemaking involves overcoming the natural desire for vengeance and requires sacrifice of one's pride and time. In other words, making peace requires that you let go of justice for yourself. In Isaiah chapter 54, Isaiah calls a new covenant the covenant of peace. God will create a world where the chaos of sin will be reversed with the covenant of peace. You see, one of the results of the new covenant is that it will not only bring peace between God and us, but also bring peace between us and others. The new covenant will result in peace amongst nations, peace amongst individuals, peace with the animals, and peace over the entire world. And as his citizens, we are to reflect Jesus' kingdom peace in a world that lacks peace. Now, if we reflect God's kingdom peace in our lives, Jesus adds that this will result in the following, for they shall be called sons of God. The phrase sons of God does not refer to the position we have as children of God. We are adopted as children of God because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Here, Jesus is using the phrase sons of as a way to compare our character with God. During this time, people are called sons of something to say their character reflects that person. Remember the nickname Jesus gave John and James? Sons of Thunder. He is not saying that James and John are descendants of thunder. Instead, Jesus is saying their characters reflects that of thunder, violent, angry, and unpredictable. So when we make peace, Jesus says that we reflect the character of God. This is the way John Brodus says this. There is no more godlike work to be done in this world than peacemaking. I know this is a difficult beatitude to swallow. Jesus never expects us to do anything he has not already done for us. Remember who the ultimate son of God is? Jesus is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah chapter 9. Jesus is the one who made peace between us and God through his death on the cross. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So as his citizens and as God's children, reflect the character of your father. And sometimes that means to not defend yourself even if you have every right to. Now what if people don't want to make peace with us? This leads to the final beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to highlight something in this beatitude. Notice that Jesus refers to people who are persecuted for righteousness sake. He's not talking about people who are experiencing persecution because of their dumb decisions or sin. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. In other words, if you stole something and then go to jail, you're not being persecuted because of righteousness. You're simply experiencing justice for your actions. You see, some Christians don't realize that some of the trials or difficulties they go through in life is not a result of their righteousness, but of their bad decisions. However, if you are truly living according to Jesus' kingdom righteousness, expect to meet resistance. But while you suffer for righteousness sake, remember the second half of this beatitude. For theirs is a kingdom of heaven. Notice the verb is in the present tense. Jesus did not say that one day you will have the kingdom of heaven. No, he says that you will possess it today. Keep in mind the context of the sermon. Jesus is talking to mainly Jewish people who are following him. They were being persecuted by Rome for believing in the true God instead of bowing down to Caesar. Some of them witnessed people get murdered by the Roman government for believing in God. If you were in their shoes, wouldn't you want to know that all the pain and suffering you are going through is worth it? Jesus gives them encouragement in this sermon by telling them that they are a part of God's kingdom. Notice that the first and last beatitude end the same way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus cares for his disciples so much that he expands on his beatitude and personalizes it for them. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. 
Verses 11 through 12 switches from the third person to second. He is no longer speaking about people, but about them. And he says that they are blessed even when others revile them and persecute them for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But I want to highlight a key phrase, falsely on my account. Again, Jesus makes it clear that he is not referring to people who have legitimate reasons to say evil against his disciples for living unrighteous lives. Jesus is talking about the fact that people will accuse them of things that are not true. They will be accused of being traitors to Rome, even though that's not true. They will be accused of doing ministry for money, even when that's not true. Jesus adds this, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Why should we rejoice if we are being persecuted and not accepted, even from people we love? Because our reward is great. The word reward referred to a prize. Jesus says that this reward is great, implying that it goes beyond anything we can imagine we deserve. Now, we don't know exactly what it is, but it is clear that those who faithfully serve King Jesus in this life will receive a reward that is great in his kingdom. Remember, in his kingdom, we will all have different roles and jobs. We will all live in different territories. And Jesus says that we will receive different rewards based on how we serve them in this life. So while you are being persecuted for Jesus' sake, look forward to the kingdom where King Jesus will give you a great reward that goes beyond anything you deserve. And if your eye is on Jesus and the reward he will give to you, you will have a different perspective about your sufferings in this life. Look at how the apostles responded to being persecuted when they shared the gospel. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. I like the way Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes the meaning of our suffering in following Jesus. He writes, Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ, and it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. In fact, it is a joy and a token of His grace. Jesus ends the Beatitudes by reminding us about those who have lived for God's kingdom and suffer. Just like the Old Testament prophets who were persecuted for telling people about God, so would Jesus' disciples as well. So while we are being mistreated or persecuted because of our faith in Jesus, let us never forget that we are not alone. We are part of a community who have suffered for Jesus' sake. You are not the only one who has been mistreated because of your faith in Christ. You are not the only one who have lost friends because of your faith. Listen, your suffering does not mean that you are failing in life. How do we picture happiness? We imagine a powerful man or woman with Instagram photos of vacation and nice cars and houses. But how does Jesus picture happiness? A person in spiritual poverty, a person crying over their sins, a person who is humble, a person who hungers and thirsts for justice, a person who does acts of mercy, a person who is pure in their motives and action, a person who makes peace, a person who suffers because they live for Jesus and his kingdom instead of the American dream. And it is this type of person who is a part of God's kingdom. Thank you to today's sponsor, Awe Reverence. They offer a free digital worship music app called Masco. If you want to find out more, I'll leave some links below in the description box. If you missed the last video about what will make us merciful, I'll leave a link here for you to watch. And until next time, see you.